I've been making a lot of videos about ancient Rome in the last few months, and there are three good reasons for that. Well, three reasons. <laughs> Good might be a stretch. First and most obvious is that I really enjoy this stuff, and you all seem to as well. Rome is a fascinating civilization that offers us a wealth of topics to investigate as we celebrate their accomplishments and then revel in the dramatic irony as the cracks start appearing. Second, I had a form of long COVID earlier this year that sapped the old brain box for a few months and I needed to work in familiar territory as I recuperated. On that note, please dear God stay up to date on your inoculations and remember your flu shots too. And third, but most importantly, it is currently the season Season of fall, and I will guiltlessly run this joke into the ground until we get to winter. So, as we wind down our season of Rome, let's also wind down the Roman Republic by starting what will become a lengthy and interminably painful trend, Roman Civil Wars. In latter centuries, these hooligans got it down to a science, but today we'll topple the first domino and introduce Rome to the concept of political assassination. To see how this can't possibly go wrong, let's do some history. By the mid-100s BC, Rome had become rather adept at exporting violence. In 146, it capped the Punic War trilogy by burning the city of Carthage to the ground. Meanwhile, that very same year, the Roman army plundered, ransacked, destroyed, murdered, and or enslaved every man, woman, child, and artifact in the city of Corinth to complete their conquest of Greece. This was a banger year for Rome's cartographers, who had the happy task of painting a beautiful shade of red all across Greece and North Africa, but it was a mixed bag at best for the new subjects, not citizens, who lived there. Violence was a key ingredient of Roman statecraft abroad, and with such a thin line between the military and political establishments, we shouldn't be surprised when someone applies that same thinking to local politics. Oh no! With that foreboding preamble out of the way, let's meet the Gracchi brothers. Members of the lower plebeian class, these boyos were sons of a consul and general, as well as the maternal grandsons of the great general Scipio Africanus himself. During his political career, the elder brother Tiberius set about reforming land rights to be more egalitarian. The plan was that no one could own more than half a square mile of the public lands acquired by the state during wars. Notably, a lot of public land was recently acquired by the state during wars. His idea was to partition all that out in small lots for the poorer citizens citizens so that everyone, well, actually not everyone, but all the citizens had a farm and livelihood to call their own. The thing is, a version of this law had already been in place since 367 BC, but nobody enforced it, so wealthy Romans and generals gobbled up loads of public land during recent conquests. Naturally, the reason this law was ignored was the same reason Tiberius would have so much trouble getting it back on the books. Rome's old moneyest citizens tended to be senators, who had plenty to lose from a law that capped a considerable source of their family wealth. But Tiberius was not a senator himself. Rather, in 133 BC, he held the office of Tribune. In centuries past, this was the only office available to the lower plebeian class, but generations of reforms and good old-fashioned bullying eroded the social, political, and financial barriers between patricians and plebeians. And as a result, the Tribune was no slouch, having the authority to veto many government actions and upper magistrates. Tiberius' own father used this veto to save Scipio Africanus from a sham bribery trial back in the 180s BC, which is supposedly why Scipio daughter was swiftly betrothed into the Gracchi family. That particular sidebar will remain unexplored, but the relevant point is how Rome's weaponized gridlock pressured the Senate to act in the interests of the plebeians. Except this time, as Tiberius pushed his legislation through the plebeian assembly, the senators pressured an aristocratic-leaning tribune to veto it. This was legal, but had never been done before, and despite Tiberius' requests, neither the Senate nor the other tribune would budge. So Tiberius took a similarly unprecedented step and had the other guy deposed, voiding his veto and then finally passing the reforms with him and his family in charge of divvying up the plots to landless citizens. Now with all that done, even for the Romans who liked these reforms, that last bit was a little shifty. A frivolous veto was one thing, but deposing a tribune and then passing a law with blatant conflicts of interests made Tiberius look dangerous. And just like that, Rome's proto-socialist fave became problematic. Honestly, the political machinations at play here are a fascinating showcase of how Romans began breaking constitutional customs before they got to outright breaking the Republic. But let's not get off track, I promised you a body count, so here is the fun part. Fearing persecution once he left office, Tiberius took another unprecedented step of running for a consecutive second term as Tribune, which his opponents interpreted as a tyrannical power grab on top of his existential threat to their wealth. Unfortunately for them, the land reform was popular, and Tiberius' enemies in the Senate figured he would win his re-election for Tribune, so the Pontifex Maximus and several senators went over to the Assembly with the intent to cause a ruckus and stop the vote counting. But the ensuing scuffle got out of hand, and without any weapons, they grabbed what was available and subsequently beat Tiberius 
to death with clubs and chairs. As we will see later, stabbing Caesar with knives was one thing, but using chairs? Now that's a full body workout. That takes intent and a good deal of persistence. This was the first time the Roman instinct for violence had turned inward and spilled into Republican politics, and with that blood red line so spectacularly crossed, boy oh boy, it would not be the last. Frankly, the senators were already in too deep to just go home and change, so they proceeded to kill another 300 of Gracchus' supporters, thus introducing the concept of political martyrdom and removing any prejudice against the expediency of assassination. Now with that point made, I mentioned Tiberius had a brother. That would be Gaius, and his story is... well, let's see for ourselves. Gaius was unfazed by his brother's grisly demise and embarked on even more aggressive reforms when he became tribune in 123. These new policies included redoing the provincial tax system so income went back to Rome instead of the governors, then using that new revenue to offer low-priced wheat for the Roman people. Elsewhere, he cut down on bribery in the courts and stopped the Senate from playing favorites with consuls. Gaius's consistent strategy was to prevent senatorial corruption by elevating the equestrian class to advisory positions and oversight roles in the Republic. Far more daring than Tiberius's little old land laws, this thicko slate of reforms touched nearly every level of government, from revenue to public programs and courts to consuls, so it could only be passed with big help. Gaius allied with the equestrians, offering them new authority and prestige in exchange for passing those laws to help the poor and make the Republic run smoother. That all sounds good and noble, but let's remember that Gaius's brother was f***ing assassinated, so the man justifiably held a grudge. To that end, he limited the Senate's power to prosecute without the Assembly's consent and forbade anyone deposed by the Assembly from holding any other office. On paper, that's a power grab for the Assembly, but those are also just reasonable laws, so despite all the reasons the Senate hated him, he remained extremely popular with the Roman people, securing a second consecutive term as Tribune in 122. But it's here that Gaius played himself by raising the question of citizenship. Essentially, Rome was Rome, and proper Romans were citizens, but outside of Rome, the Latin-speaking population weren't citizens, and the other Italians in the peninsula had even fewer rights than the Latins. Gaius sensed widespread discontent among among these allied non-citizens and figured he could win them over by giving Latin rights to free Italians and making the Latins into full citizens. One could imagine how such a grateful new voting bloc would happily elect Gaius into everything forever, but while this solution was rather clever, it was intensely unpopular with every class of citizen in Rome. So the measure completely failed, his popularity plummeted across the board despite his astounding reforms, and he handily lost his next election for Tribune. Wait, hold on, this isn't an assassination, this is just real politique. Ugh, damn it. Wait, wait, there's another page. <laughs> oh, oh, oh yeah, okay, here we go. So, one of Gaius's pet policies was setting up new colonies of Roman citizens in Carthage in Italy, so that proper Romans had a place to live in these shiny new provinces they killed so many people to get. But the new tribune proposed to dissolve these colonies, so Gaius triggered illegal protests about it, and in the ensuing scuffles, one of Gaius's supporters was killed. The Senate, horrified at the uproar, feared a classic Gracchi brothers power grab, so they passed the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, an ultimate decree branding Gaius and his allies as enemies of the state and granting them the authority to strategically unalive them. And thus, the senators partied like it's 133 BC. Gaius and his gang fortified themselves atop the Aventine Hill, so the consul raised a mob and brought soldiers within the city walls to go slash their way up. Sources differ on the details, as is tradition, but Gaius had likely fallen on his own sword by the time the senate found him. So technically, technically, he specifically was not actually assassinated. However, 3,000 of his supporters were absolutely murdered to death during and after the riot, and that handy purge left a template for targeted political violence that later Romans would be all too eager to follow. In the years after, nearly all of Gaius' laws were repealed, but the Republic could not escape him throughout its last century. His defining reforms remained highly contentious, and the political violence of his term became frighteningly commonplace. Decades later, the issue of citizenship erupted into the Social War in 91 BC, ending with all Italians getting full citizenship but nearly toppling the entire Roman state in the process. Meanwhile, the equestrian class benefited immensely from Gaius' reforms, taking on vast new powers with none of the checks or customs that kept the Senate at least nominally in line. The Roman Republic didn't collapse overnight, and the worst of its civil wars was yet to come, <laughs> several times over, but the reforms, political battles, and violent deaths of the Gracchi brothers made it far easier to be bad, and that was a temptation the Romans 
absolutely did not need. And thus will unfold the great mishap of antiquity, as nobody could kick Rome's ass like Rome. Thank you so much for watching. I went into this video thinking it would be a carefree tale of death and destruction, but then the politics turned out to be really interesting? <laughs> Question mark? We've got one more left on the docket for Blue's Fall of Rome, so I will see you in the next video.